Okay, we're gonna get started. So, as you all know, our speaker tonight is Kent Barton. Uh, Kent is a longtime crypto enthusiast. He funded the ETH uh, meetup here in Denver. He is the co-organizer for ETH Denver, which I believe is the second largest Ethereum conference in the world, and he is the head of R&D at Shapeshift. So, please give it up for your speaker, Kent Barton. Woo! I'm Kent, and holy fuck, we're all in a room with other humans. How cool is that? I don't even know if this is actually legal right now, so don't don't tell Polis. It's not a, a state mandated event. But, uh, Identify as outdoors. What's that? <laughs> yeah, we'll crack open a window. It could be outdoors. Right? So, outdoor uh, civil rights protest. That's, that's what right. That's right. Presentations uh, actually are accepted. There you go. You can say it's religious, too. Um, <laughs> so, I, I want to start off by thanking Kira and Josh uh, so much for having me, and also uh, Justin and you know, the whole Independence Institute for hosting this. Um, so, like, like Josh mentioned, this is um, my second time back. Um, my first time talking to Choppers was in 2018, and wow, a lot has happened since then. Um, and of course, uh, yeah, originally this talk was going to be last March. And um, I mean, it's been a hell of a, a year that really impacts what I'm gonna talk about today. If I were to give this, this presentation a, a year ago, it would have been interesting. Now it's really interesting. <laughs> um, so yeah, just quick background. I've been in crypto for a while. I, I uh, learned about Bitcoin back in 2012, went down the rabbit hole, uh, started the Ethereum community in 2014, and then I've been working in the crypto space for the past four years. Uh, in a former life, I uh, got a grad degree in political science, which will inform some of this uh, we're going to talk about today. Um, so, yeah, it's I, kind of it, the thing I want to stress, and it, it occurred to me watching Victoria get up here and talk about running for office, is uh, libertarians, it, it kind of feels like, um, I hope I'm getting the right knowledge right, like a, a Sisyphus kind of thing. We're pushing that, this giant you know, thing up the hill. and. Occasionally, there's uh, encouraging signs of like, oh, you know, so and so's got elected, or oh, wow, Ron Paul had a lot of energy. But it's been consistently disappointing getting pro liberty values into uh, our democratic um, system. Uh, you know, and it just gets crowded out. Uh, the, the structure doesn't really encourage the three party system, and it sucks. But I'm here to tell you today that that's actually okay, because despite that lack of political representation, from liberty-minded individuals, this technology, crypto, blockchain technology, is going to, it, it's embodying these values and, and empowering people to, to be more uh, individual. So, um, let's just kind of dig in. Uh, I want to preface this by, uh, by, my original slide, I had like a DeLorean time machine, but if you want to jump ahead in time, things might not look great. Uh, given the current trends. Uh, you, you might imagine yourself landing in the year 2028. Uh, the cost of bread is like 50 bucks. Maybe gas is 50 bucks too. Um, maybe there is a libertarian candidate, but they just got deplatformed from social media because they're you know, saying something that's not consistent with uh, you know, uh, the president's uh, new rules on free speech. And um, you know, no doubt uh, we'll be in our like, second quarter century of a war in Afghanistan. And uh, you know, funding more wars. It, 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 the trends don't look great. Um, <laughs> however, there there is a way out of this. And even if that happens, if that shitty scenario happens, uh, there there is a way to uh, kind of escape the system and, and live a better life. And uh, actually, kind of uh, broadening our scope um, to the, the global uh, kind of the global system. You know, just thinking about uh, freedom uh, across the world. Uh, things will also, I think, improve as a result of, of crypto. So let's talk about freedom. Uh, I'm going to date myself, but I remember when I was about 10, the, the wall came down. And this was a, a very impactful sort of thing for, for me, like watching as a kid. It was sort of like, you know, I was very aware there was this evil empire that kept people really, literally behind this, uh, this curtain. And, uh, you know, it was not a free society. The wall came down, and there was this explosion of euphoria, you know, Eastern Europe quickly democratized and cast off the yoke of, of, of communism, of, of Soviet, uh, you know, I, I say communism because it, it's just it's cronyism, but um, at the time it felt like such a, 
a new start. There is a famous quote by Francis Fukuyama um, that you guys may have heard. He talked about the end of history, like this end of conflict, and, and uh, liberty was going to reign everywhere. And uh, for a while, it kind of seemed that would be the case. There is this nice time when you know uh, freedom seems to be spreading everywhere, in, in um, not just Eastern Europe, but kind of just generally in different parts. Even China, you know, it came tantalizingly close to, to not being authoritarian. If, if they hadn't rolled the tanks on Tiananmen Square, we'd be in a, living perhaps in a different universe right now. Unfortunately, that's not what happened. Fast forward to 2020, and it's it's been extremely disappointing to anybody watching those events in the early 90s. Um, China, of course, uh, did a complete uh, 180 on those initial, uh, you know, on the goals of the protesters, and is now one of, you know, large and powerful and, and overtly authoritarian state. Uh, Russia began to slightly, uh, you know, move, move towards a more democratic regime and less authoritarian, and that that completely um, failed to consolidate and reverse. Uh, more concerningly, liberty is 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 receding across the globe. This is. Um, this is not a, a fun thing to watch. So it kind of sounds like an abstraction to say liberty is receding. What does that mean? How do you quantify these things? Um, has anybody here heard of Freedom House? Great. Okay, cool. <laughs> <laughs> my, my wife, who also took political science classes with me, has heard it. Um, so Freedom House is a, a reasonably objective organization that, um, that uh, sort of manages to quantify free, not free, partially free. Uh, the, the things they look at are things like civil liberties um, and political rights. You know, is there a free press? Is there free speech? Are there free and fair elections? Um, you know, a lot of it has to do with like the political structure. Uh, democracy is by no means perfect, but it, it tends to be a better guarantor of, of things like free expression, whereas authoritarian regimes you know, abhor this. Uh, so it's kind of a, a way to, um, to, to visualize all this. Um, you know, this is not a, a pretty map. Um, it gets worse when you look into more recent changes. So this is this is how things evolved uh, from 2019 to 2020. Uh, the U.S. saw a substantial decline. Um, and, you know, the, a lot of this had to do just with the, the, the you know, chaos of an election year, um, an extremely strong uh, executive branch. Um, you know, what, what Trump was doing was um, bad, and it was also just an extension of, uh, you know, this, this king-like executive branch that's been um, been in place really since the, uh, probably FDR, getting stronger and stronger. Uh, more corruption in the U.S., uh, things like that. And then elsewhere, you know, it's just, it, it's really painting the picture of a um, declining, or uh, receding tide of freedom. Add to that COVID, which, as we all know, governments uh, are very loath to give back freedom once they've taken it. And here we are in this environment where, you know, we've kind of gradually gotten accustomed to things like lockdowns and, okay, you know, different mandates. And you can think positive and think, okay, well, these are um, temporary things, you know, to, to protect everybody. And even I think a lot of a lot of people that are more liberty minded probably felt that way at least earlier in the pandemic. Like, well, let's just be cautious here, but. At this point, things are ending, but you kind of get the sense that governments aren't going to easily give that control back. So, on, on top of all this, you have you have COVID, which has um, you know really changed changed things. Um, so, again, you know, from that perspective, it doesn't look great. But there, there's reason for optimism. The reason I call this talk a bright dawn is because I really do think that there is a there there is reason for for um, hope. Um, blooming over the horizon. It's really starting to happen even right now. Um, so here's my thesis, the big idea. Blockchain technology via its decentralized properties will shift the balance of power from ossified institutions to the individual. And the shift has already started. So ossified institutions, of course, big governments, central banks, uh, banks themselves, um, uh, rent-seeking, um, monopoly-perpetuating corporations who, who work uh, in tandem with, with states. These institutions, their, their time is limited because of this technology. And we're gonna look into what, why that's gonna happen. So the way I frame this is kind of in a, a problem solution sort of framework. We're gonna look at some different problems that are facing us um, with that liberty context in mind, and then think about, and look at how, how blockchain technology 
can, uh, can help uh, solve that. Uh, we're going to co cover some ground. I'll make sure not to run too long. Uh, if you have questions, if you could please just hold those till the end um, so we can fit everything in. So we kind of have a good mix here. I see some uh, crypto rock stars in the audience um, who are already uh, familiar with this. Um, some of you may not be, so I'm going to kind of speak to both of these audiences. Um, if you are newer to crypto, um, this slide is very important. Um, you know, you, you kind of get a sense for what blockchain is, blockchains are, um, okay, with Bitcoin and this and that, but um, it's not always clear if, if you just kind of look at um, the surface level of crypto, what, what exactly, why is it so powerful? When you understand these things about, about, about blockchain technology, you'll really understand why it's so transformative. Um, so, what are they? What is it? It's immutable. Um, you can't go back in time and, and change a transaction. Um, if I if I send a, uh, you know some Bitcoin to Justin over there, um, he can be very sure within uh, you know a few hours that there is no way that um, I can take that Bitcoin back. Uh, if, if I put a record in a blockchain, it's a, a, a properly implemented blockchain. It's there for for um, perpetuity as long as the project is running. Uh, trustless. Uh, I don't need to trust a bank to send Bitcoin. I'm trusting this network of computers that's running it. This this distributed network of computers is running the software. As long as I trust that and the economic incentives that that make them run the software, uh, that, that encourage them to run the software, I don't have to worry about trusting anybody. There, there is no middleman. Credibly neutral is kind of a related point, but um, I, I know that if I use, say, the Ether, Ethereum uh, blockchain to do something, uh, there is no government that's kind of sitting there and uh, you know biasing what's going to happen um, or, or making sure that some transactions go through and some aren't. Um, and in fact, everything that happens, you can actually see what's, what's um, what's happening on the blockchain, that relates to transparency. Um, so as much as you hear about, oh, you know, some terrorists are using Bitcoin, there's a lot of fear mongering out there. Uh, Julian Assange like to refer to the, uh, the four horsemen, the, the crypto apocalypse, uh, or with the, the internet of like, you know, child porn terrorism, the usual scary things you can do with this new technology. Um, you hear a lot about, oh, you know, Bitcoin, yeah, you know, you can send this to anybody, and it's very sneaky. But in fact, everything that happens on, on these blockchains is, is open. Anybody can see what's happening. It's part of the, the beauty of, of this technology is um, it's all open source and open code and invisible. Um, I put the asterisk there because there are a few exceptions. Uh, the, the, other, you know, the other side of the transparency coin is privacy. Privacy is a uh, you know, fundamental human right. The old school cypherpunks kind of um, did a great job of, of um, uh, talking about privacy in the context of free speech. They really go hand in hand. You know, if, if in certain cases, you may want to speak your mind to do so in an anonymous way. Privacy is very important, and there are some blockchains that, that facilitate privacy as well. And finally, permissionless. Um, anybody can access, anybody across the world with, with an internet connection essentially can access a, a decentralized blockchain like Bitcoin or Ethereum. Um, you know, you, you might say, well, okay, well, you know, what about like the Great Firewall in China, this and that. That's where you get into things like mesh nets or satellite internet. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But the, the point is, you, there are no gatekeepers in this environment. It's the coolest thing ever. And you actually see that in the, the, the crypto culture as well. Everybody can rock them their own thing, do, make, their, make their point made, uh, fly their free flag. You see this a lot <laughs> in crypto conferences. Um, you can be yourself, and it's just one of these cool aspects of, of um, of crypto that I think really meshes with the, the individualism inherent in all this. So these things, super important to understand. Um, this is what makes uh, blockchain so powerful. <laughs> Get into some problems. The uh, the Federal Reserve central banks. So we'll, we'll start with the, the, the example you guys are, are probably most uh, familiar with. Um, you know, thank God the Fed is saving us from this crisis, <laughs> bringing us even more into debt. 
Um, praise be. Praise be. Thank, thank you, Yellen. Thank you. Uh, yes, these, uh, these master uh, economic planners. Um, you, you guys are probably somewhat familiar with, with this. Uh, you know, it's one of the, the primary gripes uh, of the libertarians, and uh, for good reason. You know, we, we've been going into quite a bit of debt uh, for many decades, and it's getting worse <laughs> rapidly. Uh, we're spending, we're just spending, we're creating money out of it to uh, get us out of this crisis, and um, and kind of more, um, you know, I feel like it's to like the, the, the root cause of the the leviathan that is the government, but both here and, and in most other countries, uh, it's this this uh, beast with an endless appetite that, that that consumes new debt really and spits it out in the form of waste and stupid projects in the U.S. You know, we we buy. You know, billion-dollar planes and bombs, and, and you know, blow up civilians on the other side of the planet. And this is, you know, this is horrific. And it's 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 perpetuated and made possible by the ability to print money out of nowhere. So, you know, this has been a um, a, a theme for a while. This isn't like a a new, you know, a, a new problem. Um, however, the new solution finally, and we had. Uh, a little over 10 years ago with the advent of Bitcoin is, is uh, a form of money that is completely removed from the state and it has a cap supply. Um, so this, 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 again, this is like you've been happening for about a decade. What's really interesting now is Bitcoin is acting exactly like it's supposed to. Now that we're having, now that we've had a clusterfuck of a macroeconomic situation, uh, you know, it's that it started last year. I remember about a year ago, er, uh, everything was tanking because investors were scared and moving into cash. Um, they were terrified, and you know, as a guy that holds crypto, that also sucked. It's like, oh my god. But in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, okay, this is what why crypto exists. Hopefully, it's like you know, going to do its thing, and uh, and it has. If you compare, you know, the, the, even the stock market, which is getting juiced by this money printing. Um, if you compare the performance of, of uh, Bitcoin, and Ethereum, and other cryptocurrencies to the S&P 500, and even gold, uh, it's, it's far outpacing um, all of those. Don't tell that to Peter Schiff, though. <laughs> <laughs> so it, 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 what we've had is not just a solution, but a validated solution. Um, people are recognizing, uh, individuals are recognizing the power of this technology, and also institutions. That's the biggest difference with this, this cycle of, of crypto prices going up is there's institutional buy-in. Big banks, you know, uh, they, they might suck on many levels, but they also are there to make uh, to make money and to head, you know, they need to head risk, and they see a substantial risk in the government, uh, you know, going into endless debt. Um, it's mon modern monetary theory, the beauty of it, you know. Um, on, a, on a more granular level, uh, or I should say, looking just like in another uh, uh, country. Uh, here's here's some more nice uh, quantifiable evidence of, of just the, the beauty of, of a Plan B, if you will. Uh, so this is um, uh, Peter, per, person to person volume of Bitcoin transactions in Venezuela over time, and uh, you know they, they I believe they have the worst hyperinflation on the planet currently. It's you know it's a disaster down there. It's it's approaching probably like Weimar Republic levels. It's it's horrific. Th this has been a solution for a lot of Venezuelans. The, the ability to, to uh, access something that, that's, that's independent from, from the boulevard that's getting you know, turned into toilet paper. Um, and uh, what's impressive is you know, this is an authoritarian regime where um, it's not easy to necessarily transact in crypto, but they've made it work. This, this is the canary in the coal mine. This is, this is almost like a, a, uh, a picture from the future of what could happen and what probably will happen in, in nation states across the planet as fiat asymptotically goes to zero and more money is printed because there's no end to it. They'll just keep on printing. Um, so here we have, again, there's a potential solution. Uh, here's another uh, issue, um, corruption. So earlier we looked at like, uh, you know, the US, uh, Freedom House uh, showed that, you know, the US uh, was not doing great on the liberty front. Um, and here's another uh, sort of staff they had is that their, their ratings uh, actually have declined by 11 points for the U.S. Uh, over the, the past 10 years. And this is actually crazy because, you know, I'm, I'm sure everybody remembers growing up, it's like, you know, the U.S. was kind of seen as this paragon of democracy. And, you know, 
and a lot of that was maybe idealized, but you know, there was this general understanding that we were really a very free state and always would be, and um, yeah, it's the land of the free, man. But you know, anecdotally, you feel that that's not the case. You, you see whether it, you know whether it's the president, uh, you know, or over the past four years, like decrying a, a, a free press, or you know, on on the on the flip side, you know, uh, uh, notions of political correctness and, and having to mu muzzle yourself, getting manifested maybe even in laws. Um, corruption is also a big one. So Freedom House, they, they mentioned that. Uh, big factors behind this were uh, specifically political corruption, conflicts of interest, you know, we've seen all sorts of corruption. My favorite incident of corruption, does anybody remember Blagojevich from Illinois? <laughs> I think Trump pardoned the son of a bitch. But like, <laughs> you, if you, can't, you can't imagine a cheesier, slimier politician than Blagojevich. But the only difference is he, he got caught. So how many other Blagojevich cockroaches are out there didn't get caught? This is endemic in our society. Um, and of course, like a lack of transparency in government, that, that's very related. Um, nobody really knows what's going on. Think about all the money that just got printed because of COVID. Where, where is it going? Nobody knows. Like, there's no way to track that. It's, it's just a colossal, and I feel like people almost know that, but they don't even care because it, what, what can you do about it? So, and this is a related point. Um, when you talk about corruption, uh, this is from Transparency International. It, it turns out that, uh, Levels of corruption are highly correlated with authoritarian regimes. The, the more, the more um, corrupt, the more authoritarian. Now, with, is this a chicken and egg thing? Which, which is causing which? It's hard to say, but I, I think, you know, it, it, is, it, it is likely that the corruption facilitates more government control because, uh, you know, the more you can do, have backroom uh, dealings, the more you can, uh, you know, just do shady things, create more laws and, and, and create this insular power structure. Uh, uh, so corruption and authoritarianism go hand in hand. So what's the solution to all this? The solution is to uh, go to South Beach in Miami and get drunk and forget about your problem. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> um, that sound nice. <laughs> um, no, the solution is actually, I, I use Miami here because Miami is doing some cool stuff with crypto. Uh, Miami has always kind of been a, a um, forward-thinking pro-crypto environment. Uh, and uh, lately, they, like their, their, their mayor right now is very much on the crypto train. Uh, they're talking about paying their, their city employees in Bitcoin. Uh, I, and I just read the other day that they're experimenting with putting city services on the Ethereum blockchain and record keeping on your blockchain. So here's an example of a municipality uh, leveraging the transparency of blockchains. So, you can imagine as this spreads, and you're already seeing it, actually even Indian Colorado has, has experimented and, and looked into this, um, it's coming. Uh, it, as, as bad as some states are, you know, there's a lot of people in, in the political apparatus that don't, that aren't bad, you know, they, they actually are um, wanting to do stuff like this. They wanna make government more, more efficient and function better. So things over time, I think as more uh, governments adopt this, um, not just for the transparency, but for the cost effectiveness, you know, we're gonna be able to see, okay, where, where's the money going? It'll be a little bit better insight. Um, and that will be a net positive, I think, for our society and, and for freedom. Problem, uh, banks. You know, banks are really bad in general. Um, they, uh, they are red Short the banks! Red <laughs> yeah, Kira's got the red shirt there. Long crypto short the banks. Um, Spontaneous order dot store, guys. They, they, they're monopolists. They, uh, you know, they work in, in tandem with the government to preserve their monopolies. They're red seeking. They, they, and not, the, the, the worst thing is they just suck. Like, you know, if somebody's <laughs> trying to try to send money, even to another account you have, it could take three, five days. And God forbid you want to send money internationally. It's, uh, it's awful. Money Once, launderers. Oh yeah, they have to, you know, make sure everything is, you know, cool. And in reality, they're using like software from the, the 70s. And, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so once you use crypto, it's, it's like it feels like an aphorism. You can send you can send money. Uh, it, it, it could be in, in um, Lithuanian. I can send her money in you know seconds and and for a very small amount. So um, we, you know everybody kind of hates banks. They, it's a bad experience, and they, they do um, you know they, they leverage their their power and connections to influence what's happening um, in, in politics. 
but kind of pulling back from just like the annoyance level of it, like there's, there's also a very real problems when it comes to um, being freer. And if you imagine like how, how banks operate, maybe you know across the world, there's a lot of gatekeeping involved here. You know, generally speaking, uh, a more of a middle class, more affluence uh, tend, tends to lead to, to better outcomes for, for freedom. Although that's not a one-to-one -one sort of correlation as we've seen in China, but. Generally, you know, people. If you can empower people to have their own businesses, have, you know, have uh, have their own income, uh, do their own thing, this is a positive. Uh, it's it's um, it makes them more independent, and it's a good thing. Banks make that very hard, um, and uh, you know, when you can't access capital, and you when, you know, if you're a farmer in sub-Saharan Africa and you can't get a loan, this is tough. So, uh, who who here has heard of decentralized finance or DeFi? Um, so this is Alex right here. He's going to be talking about <laughs> DeFi on, on May 5th. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay, I'm going to cover it briefly here, but this is awesome. I, I highly recommend you, you uh, come to Alex and talk as well because what's happening in, in this space is incredible. Um, so decentralized finance is a way for, uh, basically, it's finance with all the attributes that I talked about on that, that first slide. Um, anybody can access it. Uh, it's trustless. There is no <coughs> bank to, to uh, you know, say, well, you can't do this. There's no government to say you can't do this. Um, all of the government rules you sort of apply on, on the edges of this. Um, and what, what's happened is that the, the permissionless open innovation has, has triggered this entire industry of, of incredible things building on top of each other. Um, this includes like loans. So to use my example, the farmer in Africa, uh, hypothetically, this farmer could take out a loan, uh, albeit probably over collateralized, but they could a access like, a loan. Um, they could also uh, do something incredible. They, they could get access to, they, they could get uh, exposure to the price of Tesla. Uh, some you know, American stock, I, I don't think many um, farmers in Africa can easily sign up for Robinhood or you know, access US equities, but they could do that. Similarly, uh, you know, we could get, probably get exposure to like some weird uh, Hong Kong based stock because these things are happening on the blockchain. There, there are no gate, gatekeepers anymore. So in decentralized finance, and again, this, this encompasses things like, um, like lending and synthetics, which is like stocks on the blockchain. Um, this is like the kind of chart that the VCs back in like the, the era of, of like Web 2.0, you know, the, when they were, um, you know, raising money for like the likes of LinkedIn. It's this kind of hockey stick that used to make VCs freak out. And now VCs are freaking out about crypto. But th th this is this is a, a snapshot of adoption happening behind, before your eyes. Uh, you know, it's almost 60 billion or over 50 billion uh, of value is, is, is locked in the, the blockchain. This is primarily on the Ethereum blockchain, um, although it's spreading to other, uh, other projects and platforms as well. Um, so, but uh, again, let's take it back to the freedom aspect. Um, this one, because this one is a little bit not quite as direct as like maybe, you know, central banks, but it goes hand in hand. So on one hand, you have, you have Bitcoin um, providing this, this alternative to fiat. And in addition to having an alternative, like it's not just like holding it. Now, thanks to this, um, you can use Ethereum and other, other platforms to do amazing things with this, this non-state currency. So um, as you hear, you, I think you'll probably hear more about DeFi uh, in, in the coming months and years, and this is a, a net positive for global freedom as well. Problem. <laughs> 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 so tough, man. Like, so, you know, Facebook can do their thing. Like, I, I is Facebook evil? I don't know. Are, are they are they really using the government to perpetuate monopoly? I, I mean, they, people like them, and but I, I think they do suck quite a lot. Yeah. So <laughs> they, they rely on your own data to perpetuate their business model, um, and it's just it's just it's kind of your classic big non-government institution sitting in the middle of everything. It was a great bit business model for Web 2.0, but in blockchain. Technology we're positing Web 3.0 and an evolution beyond this, where there are no centralized actors. Um, what does this mean, though, and why is this important for freedom? Um, I I want to come back to the deep platforming that happened with, with Trump 
as the um, election stuff happened. Um, I'm of the belief, personally, that Twitter can do whatever they want. They're a private company. I don't care if it's the president. You can't tell them what to do. Of course, there is a lot of arguments uh, to the contrary, and now you have the Supreme Court uh, weighing in on, the, on this. I saw uh, Clarence Thomas was saying something about it recently. It's, a, it's an important issue. But the thing you guys need to understand is that by the, the next election, and certainly by 2028, this will be a, a moot point because social media platforms will exist on unstoppable blockchains and uncensorable blockchains. You'll recall that one of the, the, um, the traits, one of the properties of the, the blockchains is censorship resistance. So, you know, Twitter can decide what to do. Okay, we're gonna shut this down or that, or Facebook. Um, but in the future, you know, it's just gonna be like this open thing. You can't shut anybody up. Um, that has incredible, I think, um, uh, implications for, for just preserving free speech. To take a slightly different angle, um, Imagine, and this is where it gets really, I think, um, more in, in, in terms of uh, preserving free speech, but it's not far-fetched to imagine the, the government, uh, whether here or you know, in other countries, it happens all the time, uh, mandating certain types of free speech or, or outlining certain, um, outline cer certain speech. Uh, it, it would be easy to, to make any central, uh, centralized organization do this. Um, you know, you have, as a company, you have to follow the rules. At Shapeshift, we're a crypto company, and it, we, we hate to do it, but we have to follow the rules. You know, these rules are not pro freedom. But what are we supposed to do? We're, uh, you know, we're not going to jail over this. We have to play by the rules. Twitter, or whoever, whatever social media platform, they might not want to um, curtail free speech, but they have no choice. The key difference with blockchain-based social media platforms that are inevitably coming, I think, is that. There's nothing to stop that. And that is an incredible force for good, I think, with respect to free speech. Um, when you think about countries uh, that don't have uh, the sort of free speech guarantees that we have, you know, it's not perfect here, but it is, you know, it's pretty damn good. Uh, if you think about other places, this is a, a incredibly powerful as well. Um, imagine, uh, you know, this. If you're in China and you want to speak out against the, the, uh, the government, you have a way to do that, um, especially in tandem with things like mesh nets and satellite internet um, to get around uh, VPNs. That's another interesting point is like, and I, I need to remind myself of this sometimes, is like blockchain technology is not developing in a vacuum. There's all sorts of other crazy innovations happening as well in parallel that, that could make it um, even more effective and interesting and game changing. Um, so again, yes, it's a, a fundamental property of censorship resistance. Um, here's another problem, a lack of property rights. Um, property rights really go hand in hand with, with uh, I think, liberty. If, you know, we've seen this time and again. <laughs> I mean, I, I think the, the, the most tragic example ever um, in history is probably Cambodia, where they, they took communism to the, to the extreme and they uh, didn't just outlaw any sort of semblance of property. They, they sent everybody to collectives and they, you know, they killed everybody. And one, one thing that gives me goosebumps is like, this, could, this sort of thing could happen today. And I think we saw that with COVID, like shit hits the fan, things can get very dark. And I, I hope that, if, I guess, I hope people, because of COVID, kind of realize like just how dire it can get. Like we can't take it for granted. Like, Cambodia can happen anywhere. There, and then there's awful stuff that happens across the world. But pardon the, uh, the detour. <laughs> but uh, property rights are, you know, really a fundamental part of, of freedom. Um, how, how might you go about uh, protecting or gaining property rights in situations where, um, you know, let's say you're in a country that just maybe it has a weak state, but it has weak structure all around. Maybe it doesn't, it never even really had banks. Uh, you know, there's a lot of countries like this in, uh, in Africa, perhaps South America. Um, just a weak, weak structure everywhere. Uh, a solution is the tokenization of everything. Um, so, <laughs> every, okay, who's heard of NFTs? Now that's interesting because the NFT thing hit more recently. DeFi's been around longer, but the difference is most people don't really, your average like, like my aunt Shirley doesn't understand like, you know, 
I'm going to like ape into this liquidity farm or something. This is hard to understand. But when you see on CNN that somebody sold some art for like seventy million dollars, like what? And it's a, just a digital art thing. You know, like that's crazy. So NFTs. Are, are a way to um, assign scarcity and value to things on uh, to di digital things, whether it's a screenshot uh, of, of a piece of art or, or some music. Um, and this is, I think, just going to ignite an entire um, revolution in, in like creating things. Um, I actually bought a, a piece of art from a 17-year-old sci-fi artist in India a few weeks ago, and it was the coolest thing ever. It's like I'm just going directly to this incredible. Um, artist, this kid, and you know, I, I, I'm not sure, I think he lives in Delhi, but I assume the money I sent him stretches a lot further than it does here because, uh, you know, uh, of, uh, because the rupee is so weak. So he's able to engage in geo-arbitrage, make uh, more money on his art. I'm able to support this, this person directly, which is amazing. So th that alone is cool. Um, is it going to help fight authoritarianism? Um, probably not directly, but what will? is um, this idea of NFTs is not just for our music. Um, I think within seven to 10 years, almost everything will be tokenized. So that's to say that, um, you know, imagine a house, a, a, a record of a house, ownership of a house will exist as a, uh, a token, a, a, a one of a kind token on the blockchain. And this is, um, you know, that's really cool. You could actually like share ownership uh, or share investment in different things. Um, this idea of tokenizing everything is already starting to happen and it's gonna get more, um, it's gonna spread. If you think about places where property rights don't really exist, this is the perfect solution. Um, all there needs to be is some sort of like legal structure to kind of weave in the, the real world or what we call like meat space and cyberpunk window with, um, with kind of like, you know, what's happening on the, on the blockchain. Um, and, uh, I remember the last bull market, there was some talk of like uh, this happening somewhere in Africa. I haven't actually looked into it, but I, I think this will be an exciting development that's going to be coming down the pipe. Okay. <laughs> so, that sounds great. What could go wrong? I mean, in life, sometimes things go wrong. Um, the, the most obvious thing is something probably you know very top of mind for all of us is the government is really good at fucking things up, and <laughs> they can certainly they can certainly uh, you know stick a uh, stick a uh, poke us in the side with this and, and really give us a bad time in crypto. Um, the most obvious way for states to, to screw up crypto, I think, is just to um, mess with the on ramps. That the way that you get value into the system. Uh, uh, fortunately, that hasn't happened in the U.S. I don't think it's likely to happen soon, but it is, it is always kind of like a gray swan threat. But we have seen this happen in, like, you know, China. They outlawed um, uh, most crypto trading. Um, they did that because they want to control the, the currency. They they, they want to control flows of the currency. And for a, 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 a very strong authoritarian state like them, that that's like the, the idea of some non-state currency existing is completely antithetical to what they're trying to do. Um, even in India recently, they, they kind of doubled down on a, on a crypto ban. Uh, I don't know if it's going to be lasting, but they talked about some really onerous penalties, like you're going to jail for using crypto. And this, that sort of action from the government would could really uh, hamper innovation. You know, what, can you stop crypto, uh, can you stop blockchains that are properly decentralized? I don't think you really can because everything is so distributed. You'd have to stop the internet. However, you could really hamper innovation. You could you could prevent people from easily um, getting money in and out of the system, and if you if you have choke points like that, it's it's going to give everybody a bad time. Um, uh, a more immediate and worrisome concern is, is this. Um, I don't know if you guys have, have heard about this notion of central bank digital currencies. At first blush, it kind of seems like, oh okay, so like, well like China or other governments, they're kind of like going to create their own Bitcoin. That's kind of cool. It's not about um, trying to do more like Bitcoin. What, what this is about is about surveillance and control. And this is, um, as excited as I've been and as optimistic, this is the thing that scares the shit out of me. This is a terrifying Orwellian scenario. So what this is, is China and in other, uh, other countries, including the US, are studying this as well. I think we'll eventually get our own digital currency, uh, or central bank digital currency in the States. 
what this is, is they're using kind of a semblance of a blockchain, one that's very centralized, because again, they're not gonna seek control to any third party app. They want exclusive control. So a database, essentially, with, that they control, maybe with some blockchain properties, um, will, will sort of gradually replace cash. I think eventually China will, will outright ban physical cash. Why would you want to do that? Because uh, you know, <laughs> that if you're anonymously spending something, uh, you're, you're going to, um, or you want privacy, uh, there, nothing really beats cash in terms of physical interactions. Um, so it, this creates all sorts of scary scenarios. Like imagine, imagine China. Imagine you're, you know, a citizen in Shanghai or something, and uh, you know, you get some notification or a fine. It turns out last week you actually made a blacklisted transaction, or maybe you interacted with somebody. Uh, this person over here didn't have a good social credit score, which exists. The social credit system exists in China. So, you know, uh, it's not a stretch to think that, that this could happen. Um, there's approved transactions. They're, they're monitoring everything you do. This is like something out of Black Mirror, and it's going to be foisted on the Chinese citizens in the next few years. Um, not only that, but the, the, the government will have even more, um, their, their puppet strings over fiat Will be even more, um, will be even more uh, controlling. For example, there is a, an example they gave here is uh, okay. You track spending in real time, track your citizen spending in real time. Or what if um, they give a, a stimulus, but it's a time um, a time sensitive stimulus. So you just got um, you know 500 yuan in your digital wallet, but oh, it expires in a week, so you have to run out and spend that. So the government has even more leverage by which to manipulate the, the, the um, money supply and citizens' behavior. I mean, this is straight up terrifying. Um, I don't want to end on a down note, though. <laughs> <laughs> so there is this, and that's that privacy-preserving technology. So there are projects, some of you may have heard of Zcash and Monero. Now Ethereum is starting to get privacy-preserving technology. Um, this will be so crucial for, for citizens in, in states where um, a digital currency exists to have as an alternative. And will these will Zcash ever be uh, legal in China? Probably definitely not, but, <laughs> <laughs> but that won't stop people from using it. I, I, I like to think about, um, I, I think a, a really inspiring sort of you know, uh, historical note here is like the, the dissidents in, in Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union who lived under you know, insane repression from probably you know, one of the strongest domineering states we've ever seen Yet they were able to still at least put up some sort of fight and, and organize, and they did that through this really cool um, underground uh, network of like tape trading, um, you know, audio and video tapes, and they, they were able to thrive that way. There was at least an underground. There was a way to resist, and the way to resist this is through privacy preserving blockchains, which, uh, thanks to things like uh, Elon's satellite internet, I think will be accessible. So all is not lost. Um, for this, and for what it's worth, I don't know if the, the Federal Reserve will wind up, you know, with something quite as um, as onerous as this. Um, you know, we do value collectively privacy more, um, but it's it, it wouldn't be good, and who knows where things could head. So, something to keep in mind. So, okay, we're going to start to wrap up here. Um, what should you do if you want to? Well, let me rephrase that. I highly recommend that if you don't, if you're not familiar with this technology yet, you start to learn about it. Um, th this technology is ine inevitable. So uh, it's sort of where the internet was maybe in 1995. It's there. It's coming. You know, people are started starting to use it now with this NFT thing. People are actually it's going mainstream a little bit, just like you know maybe email did in like the, the early to mid 90s. It's happening. The more you learn about this, and the more you equip this, yourself with knowledge, the better prepared you'll be able to, to use this technology. It's happening like right now, and it's gonna get even more important in the, the near future here. So what should you do? Um, if you're not familiar with crypto, per, go to coinbase.com, purchase some. Um, I'm not saying this is, you know, this is not investment advice. I, I, do, I do think it would be wise to hold Bitcoin and Ether and some other uh, tokens over the long run because they are, um, you know, separate from this. It's a great way to escape from the uh, probable, probable inflation that's coming. But at the very least, um, get your head around it. Spend some, buy, buy some things with crypto. Um, it's like a magical feeling. I think everybody remembers their, their first um, crypto purchase. Maybe it was on Silk Road for some sweet acid. Or maybe, or maybe you were just sending your buddy something and you were like, you know, dinner, but like, it's, it's amazing because you're like, 
it, it feels like magic. Like I just did this, and I didn't need a bank, and it just happened immediately, and it's just an, it's an incredible experience. So I, I want you to have that experience. It's great. Um, hold some. Learn, learn what it means to just kind of hold crypto. Um, and if you really want to get into it, get a hardware wallet. Um, these things are, are really um, allow you to be your own bank. In crypto, we have a saying, not your keys, not your coins. If you have access to your own private keys, you are your own bank. No, nobody can take that away from you. And it's, um, you know, it's, it's amazing. Um, learn about Bitcoin. Um, there is a guy named Andreas Adenopoulos who is the, uh, the most inspiring, I think, crypto educator out there. He's, he's incredible. He has a lot of good content online. Get on YouTube and Google uh, Introduction to Bitcoin. He has some great content about why it exists. He likens it to the internet of, of money. Um, and it just really, he's so enthusiastic and fun to watch. He's great. Um, if you want to learn more about Ethereum, uh, I gave a talk a few years ago called Ethereum Explained. And it was designed specifically for um, people who have le learned a little bit about Bitcoin but want to learn about Ethereum. There are some very important differences between Ethereum and Bitcoin. Um, and uh, that will help you get your head, your head around it. Uh, incidentally, if you ever encounter a Bitcoiner that tells you that everything but Bitcoin is a scam, walk away from them because they're wrong. Um, <laughs> there's certain Bitcoiners that are very dogmatic and religious and it's you know, a little bit crazy. Uh, and uh, they're completely living a different reality because a lot of other blockchains are flourishing now. Um, don't, just ignore that stuff. Or maybe listen to the stuff, they're, the good stuff they're saying, but don't listen to this uh, dogmatic uh, stuff they spew. Uh, finally, I talked about DeFi. This, this gets really um, interesting, it gets complex, but I think it would be really good for, um, if you want to get a sense of just how, how powerful blockchains are, like what, 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 what sort of applications can be built on this. Alex is a DeFi rock star. Um, Woo! It's, it's insane. Like I, I've seen this guy like put together. That's Danielle's like, babe. That's my babe. That's my babe. Guys. I'm looking forward to chatting with everyone, going over the ecosystem and some of the tools to kind of navigate it. So thanks, babe. A couple weeks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're gonna love it. Yeah, that's, that's good. Um, so I just want to close on this. Um, this is a quote from the uh, Soviet dissident uh, Alexander Solzhenitsyn and author of Gulag Archipelago, and I think it's just a very um, fitting quote for where we are right now. The simple step of a courageous individual is not to take part in a lie. One word of truth outweighs the world. Blockchains are a way to legally and ethically remove yourself from the lie. You don't have to play such a, a part of, um, in the system anymore. You're not stuck in the system. You can voluntarily uh, step away from it, and this will be increasingly possible um, as the technology spreads uh, around the world. Thank you. Yeah, Q and A. Yes, uh, questions. Okay, so one of the things that you said was like that you thought that maybe Twitter, or, or sorry, Twitter or Facebook, maybe they were influenced by regulation. Um, and I, I thought that you were alluding to taking Donald Trump down at the end. So I was curious just to hear, is that what you meant? And did you mean that like somehow the government wanted him you know, taken down? Uh, okay, so yeah, let me clarify. I was kind of like, <laughs> so Twitter made that decision, I think on their own volition. And I think they had every right to, because there was a private company that thought uh, this guy's fucking crazy, we're taking him off and you know, it's, it's causing a lot of problems. Um, what I was really getting at is a situation where, um, it, it kind of underscore the point that in the future, that conversation will be moot because people will be on these uncensorable, non, un unstoppable platforms where there is no arbiter to say you can or can't do this. That's one. And then two is um, in situations where the government comes in and says, oh, that, that's not mandated free speech. And you know th this is something that's not as top of mind in the U.S. right now, but is in a lot of other countries and could be here. That is um, really powerful to say. Um, well, you can actually stop this platform. Um, in, in China, uh, so this actually even happened a few years ago. But some um, some people there put something I, I believe related to um, some sort of corruption case that happened in China on the Ethereum blockchain. You know, and it's like a great example of like 
there it is, you know, and it, to this day, anybody could go to that specific, um, you know, block that was minted on Etherscan or whatever and, and, and read this, uh, assuming they had access to, to that site. So the, um, that unstoppable nature of censorship resistance, I think, will be a, a huge weapon for um, free to speak. I have just a follow up then. What would you, s like, I feel like most people want to be behind free speech, but there's always something that offends them. And so that's where they want to draw the line. How, how would you explain it to people that what, what true free speech is or what true, you know, immutable free speech would be? Um, I mean, I, I, I guess it might be an environment, like for people that were really, you know, that encountered that line, maybe they would opt for networks that were more centralized, where there, there was, you know, uh, there was some sort of line in the sand. Um, maybe there will be certain blockchains too that, that maybe maybe they're a little bit more centralized. And this might be blockchain technology. It's like you know maybe the platform is uh, more governable. Like think about a DAO. That's like a distributed organization that people have access to if they hold the token. Uh, maybe maybe they, the, the investors in the DAO can say, well, we're going to decide this or that. But at least it's like out of the hands of a big centralized thing. The interesting thing will be like the inevitable case once like decentralized file store storage becomes more prominent. Like pedophiles will put child porn on it. Like they will use it. This will happen, and there will be an inevitable flat backlash and saying, "See, crypto's bad. There's child porn on the blockchain. We got to outlaw." The same thing happened with the internet. Like, did the internet facilitate sharing of child porn? Yes, it did. Does that make the internet bad? Of course not. Like, go after the pedophiles, not the technology. But I think that battle will certainly be coming. Great answer. Thanks, Kent. Thank you. Uh, can you give us some thoughts on your view of hyper-Bitcoinization and maybe some nuances of what, like, the roadmap that fiat currencies face, what that looks like? Um, fiat, to me, feels like a race to the bottom, like, right now. <laughs> like, the trends were not, were not great. Um, you know, in terms of like, if, if, you, if you're like a guy that is thinking, well, maybe fiat has a chance, like, you know, there is this steady move of just like more and more debt, and that just got kicked into overdrive with COVID. Now it really shows no signs of stopping. Yeah. You know, maybe once actual, like, real obvious inflation kicks in, uh, the government will try to rein it in, uh, raise taxes to extortionary rates, and, you know, maybe uh, do what, um, you know, Paul Volcker did in the early 80s by, by sending interest rates to like do double digits to try to rein it in. But the, the bottom line is like, dude, like the, the horses are out of the barn, it's gonna get bad. And this applies to the European Central Bank, the Federal Reserve, you know, um, interesting in like, like China, and some of the Asian countries that have, have managed to get through this with, with like less debt, they might be in a relatively stronger position. But the bottom line is like, the fiat is just, you know, I think ultimately doomed, and hyper Bitcoinization really goes hand in hand with like this, th this uh, inflating away of um, of uh, the dollar. So like, what's the roadmap for that? What's the time frame? Um, uh, gosh, I don't know. I mean, this this certainly like COVID has certainly accelerated it, and now now that the idea of endless spending has become like this this accepted theory, modern monetary theory. Right. I mean, this is crazy land we're yeah. living in. What I think is interesting, so just to take the example of, um, of MicroStrategy, Michael Saylor is you know, buying Bitcoin, going into debt, issuing a billion dollars in debt to buy Bitcoin, it's a company all like, this is like a speculative attack on the US currency. And I, I wonder if that's gonna happen in other currencies, and other terms, some are gonna fail, and like, the, the whole thing is just gonna sort of get weaker at bottom, and I'm just kind of curious, like, you know, what your thoughts might be at five years, 10 years, where we'd see as far as like, currencies coexisting, or is there going to be one to rule them all, or is there going to be a splintering, or something like that? I mean, I think eventually there could, I think what you're alluding to is like, maybe like you could speed up the, the kind of demise of fiat if more people choose an alternative. That could happen. Yeah. You know, you get a, a million Michael Saylors, and yeah, that could happen. And then in terms of like currencies coexisting, like they already do, and I, I don't think all fiat's going away anytime soon. There would probably always be fiat. There's going to be still governments. It's not like we're going to wind up in some, you know, Randy and Utopia after fiat goes away. And there's going to be some states and there's going to be fiat, but they will coexist and people will have an alternative, a, a plan B. Um, and there will be certainly mul multiple digital currencies coexisting as well, multiple uh, decentralized digital currencies. We already have this as well. If you go to like coincap.io, you'll see a giant list of, um, you know, hundreds of projects. I mean, there must be over, 
Uh, how many, to Eric, how many Thousands. tokens are there? Thousands. Five billion. Five billion. <laughs> <laughs> Eric Voorhees quoted. <laughs> <laughs> there are endless tokens out there. Like, um, yeah. it's because there's so much permissionless innovation. But um, yeah, I, I think that, that there will be different use cases applied to all variety of, of uh, situations. Here. Okay, so the name of your talk is A Bright Dawn, Self-Sovereignty in the Coming Crypto Age. What other technologies do you think are in this bright dawn type stage that will um, further, I assume, most of our quests towards self-sovereignty? I mean, it's a little more sci-fi, and I'm a sci-fi geek, but space exploration, like, uh, I can't help but get excited when I see everything, like, you know, like SpaceX is doing, and, like, um, you know, eventually people will be able to, you know, have space tourism, we're going to be like mining asteroids, and <laughs> it feels like that's kind of happening in, in parallel. Maybe eventually the moon will have its own blockchain because there's so much latency. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Mars um, will. A real Dogecoin on the moon. A real Dogecoin, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It'll be the official like fiat of the moon. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, other, other technologies like, um, I don't know, things like 3D printing that gives the end user the ability to do something, and also. Um, like, AI kind of seems to me like kind of a double-edged sword because I feel like the government is going to use it to do bad things. But uh, do you have any, any favorite technologies? I mean, I'm definitely not a Luddite, so I think they're all good, but... <laughs> <laughs> you got to stop the innovation? Yeah. I mean, it's kind of a follow-up question, but, you know, in your mind, what's the killer, killer app, really? Because it seems like it's still trudging along, but not really taking off. Uh, I mean... Currencies for sure, uh, but I, I feel the government could easily pull the rug from under under that. Um, if you're familiar with MMT, obviously they could just say tomorrow you can start paying your taxes in Bitcoin, and that's sort of like an in instant inflation for them. Uh, so, what's the killer app? And then the, the sort of embedded question to the SpaceX thing is, uh, how, you know, what's the obstacle to tokenizing commodities? Um. Okay, so uh, the killer app, I think, really is money. Um, there is a lot the government can do to screw it up, but we, we've seen that. Like, you know, Bitcoin ha it is, um, has been a remarkable success because it is, you know, people want an alternative. Um, and then with something like Ethereum, you have a lot of stable coins, which give people the ability to transact. Um, uh, you know, it's a store of value, it's a means of exchange in a, in a, in a stable kind of non-fluctuating currency. But separate from all that, I think the first instance we've seen of a killer app is the, the NFTs. And it sounds kind of silly because there's so much hype. You get on the news and people are talking about, you know, such and such art. And it, you know, I think Charmin toilet paper made an NFT out of toilet paper. A little, little shit coin or something. But like, <laughs> <laughs> it's a silly it's a thing. But there, there's, a, there's a kernel of awesomeness there. It's like, it, I think it's sort of like similar to like how email was relatable to everybody back in like the early 90s or mid-90s when they got on Prodigy or AOL or CompuServe. It's like, I don't know how it works, but I know that I can just send an email to my friend on the other side of the planet and they can send me a message back. Um, NFTs are a little bit more relatable. Um, I mean, probably not as universal as, as email right now. Um, looking further down the road, I mean, that's where it gets really interesting. It's like, uh, you know, and all of us working in crypto, you know, we kind of have our blinders on, look at what's right in front of us. But it, it is fun to like look down the road and just try to speculate what what could happen. Um, I think titles, property will all be on the blockchain, um, uh, and then it just gets interesting when you combine that um, with with other things. Like for example, uh, maybe driving cars on the blockchain. Maybe, maybe they're instantly sending some sort of payments for certain things, and uh, kind of like. Um, machine, uh, you know, the idea of, of machines connected to the internet, um, machines interacting with each other and making payments to each other in sort of some sort of AI context. It gets really far out. It's fun to speculate. Uh, the other question, com uh, you said commodities? Yeah, because uh, they're not fungible. I mean, they are fungible, and, but so NFT is not appropriate for that, right? Um, NFT, uh, you would probably want to have a different representation uh, what we call an ERC-20, a fungible token to represent a commodity like, you know, gold or something. And you already have this, um, you know, say I can lock up a dollar and create a ERC-20 token and send it to you. Uh, so there are ways to put commodities on blockchain as well. Yes? 
you said that in 10 years, everything will be tokenized. And you pointed out that governments will not to have a, a homogenous response with your example of Miami. Um, when do you think that the first government will sell a tokenized permanent residency token? Mm -hmm. That is a good question. I mean, so you would have to put citizenship on the blockchain. I bet Estonia will do it first. Estonia They are so, they are like living in the next century. <laughs> Estonia is awesome. I, so hypothetically, there's nothing to stop you from doing that. Like if I was Estonia right now, I wanted to do that. Um, I, would, I would use Ethereum and I would create some very nicely audited contract, the citizenship contract, and then I would, I would create some sort of legal mesh to, to make sure it's recognized in, in the framework of real world legal, and then that would be awesome. And then uh, a lot of um, you know rich Bitcoiners would want to buy that citizenship. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. I just um, I want to. You touched briefly on privacy at the end, and uh, I, I talked to a lot of people that are interested in crypto or just kind of learning about it. And it seems like one of the major concerns is government getting involved <coughs> and just looking at the records and then either taxing it or seizing it, or just saying, hey, you owe back taxes. And I was wondering if maybe you could touch a little bit more in depth on like, um, what it means to actually be, to hold your own private keys and you know, different ways that we can subvert the state from getting involved, because really a lot of like the hacking and government intervention has been on the exchanges, which are not secure and not on those private servers, and I was wondering if you could elaborate on Sure. Um, I highly recommend not using cryptocurrency to avoid paying taxes. The, the government is watching. There's a company called Chainalysis that has now like billions of dollars in, in valuation because they are working with the government to trace things. Like the, the government is not stupid and they, they know people are, you know, uh, want to use this to avoid taxes. Uh, they've subpoenaed many crypto exchanges and um, you might get away with it, you might not. It, it sounds like a libertarian fantasy, and I know it, it certainly did back in like 2012, 2013, but it's, it's a bad idea, I think. However, that's not to be discouraging. Like, um, so you hold your own, your own tokens, and it's pseudonymous. Uh, so you, know, you, you might have this address, but nobody really knows that it's, it's you necessarily, unless they maybe do some serious digging. So that, that, there's something that, you know, that, that's somewhat powerful to have that. Um, in terms of peer-to-peer -peer transactions, you know, that, that is, like, let, let's say I'm going to um, sell you some, some mushrooms or something, and maybe you don't have any cash, and hey, I take, you, you know, Dcash. Um, that's a great use of a peer-to-peer -peer transaction that, um, you know, it's, that would seem to me pretty much as, as good as just exchanging good old cash. Like, nobody knows what that transaction was for. So on a more P2P level, I think that's, you know, that's great. And that's an incredible tool in your, in your um, you know, freedom toolbox to have. That's great. Are you offering <laughs> I think I'm out. <laughs> yes. Do you think crypto enthusiasts are in a higher rate of voting accidents? <laughs> <laughs> it might happen. <laughs> Sorry, the keys are at the bottom of the lake. Oh no, what happened? What about uh, taking out crypto loans to avoid taxable events? You can totally do that. Um, but taking out a loan is not taxable. Um, and uh, that's one of the appeals, I think, of, of DeFi. The only, the only catch is you have to over collateralize, so it's not the most capital efficient thing to do, but um, that's, a, that's a great way to totally above the board um, avoid paying taxes. Imagine if you wanted to put a down payment on a house, just lock up some crypto. Of course, there is a risk that if, if your collateral declines in value, you, you get you know, margin call, or you gotta put your, you know, it might not work out financially, but um, that, that's a perfectly good path. Yeah, um, you mentioned Governments using crypto. Somebody mentioned something like a residency type of thing. Is that? Do you think that's a desirable thing, where you would interact with the government primarily through through the blockchain? Or is that something that we want? And what are the implications of that? For example, if that's the way you um, interact with the government for maybe proving your citizenship, does that imply that something like internet access become a right for everybody? Um, I mean, I, I think it would be like easier, like imagine this, I'm, I'm thinking, I often have thought about this scenario when I was like traveling internationally, but like it would be kind of cool to have a passport on a blockchain. It would just be easier that way. You wouldn't have to worry about losing it. You know it's there. Uh, you know, you just go through and maybe you, you scan some QR code along with your, 
some other um, provable identity or something. Um, I don't think it necessarily changes anything in terms of like, um, you know, are, are they able, to, perhaps like they, they can monitor you more effectively. That is something to, to keep an eye on, um, is like maybe the government could start to use crypto to, to monitor your behavior, kind of like what China wants to do with their digital currency. But I'm sorry, the last part of your question? Yeah, so like if you only can interact with the government via some blockchain, that implies that you have to have some sort of, everybody has to have some sort of technology available to them, right? Like yeah. Connectivity or device or something. This so if that's a desirable state, then that almost implies something like that. This will probably only increase, like, I mean, ever since like the mid-90s, there's been this idea of like a digital divide and the notion that the government has to make sure everybody has access to the internet. I think that's part of Biden's latest spending thing. So people will probably, this will only, given, given the, the importance of having access to this technology, it probably will, there will be saying that there, there is a right. But in practical terms, I think, as long as you have internet an internet connection, you will be able to have access to crypto. And then some of the infrastructure, like wallet and identity stuff, is, is, is there or it's coming as well. So What's up, dude? <laughs> <laughs> so I just wanted to ask, is Ethereum, is Ethereum, are Ethereum contracts really unstoppable? Like, was the DAO really <laughs> unstoppable? So, okay. Uh, what, what this guy, uh, Chris, is referring to, Chris is awesome. Um, there, there is an incident awesome. that happened in, uh, I believe it was 2015. Uh, this project on Ethereum raised million in 2016. And it got hacked really bad, and people lost their money. So th this is an important thing to note. Like when I'm talking about unstoppable, uh, and th this applies for any blockchain. But like we're talking about an ideal state where something can't be shut down and everything is working properly. In reality, and especially with like smart contract blockchains that do a lot more than just Bitcoin, like shit can hit the fan. Like people have lost a lot of money. Um, if the code isn't written properly, bad things can happen. I think this is emblematic of like early stage technology. Like, so one thing to keep in mind is like, you know, yes, these things happen with unaudited smart contracts, but the mechanisms for auditing have gotten way better since the DAO hack. You know, there's a whole there's a whole industry now around um, auditing things, and like, well, yeah, but I mean, doesn't didn't that set a precedent that if there's something that people don't like about the code, that basically it can get rolled back to a previous state? And doesn't that then imply that if the government doesn't like um, something that happened in an Ethereum contract, that they could put pressure on the Ethereum Foundation to roll back a change? I, I don't think so, because let's say they convinced Vitalik to, and sorry, we're about to get an insider baseball here. <laughs> but what happened in the aftermath of that, that DAO thing is it was very early on in Ethereum, and uh, there was this kind of uh, decision collectively made, but, but a controversial one, to actually reverse what happened and give everybody their money back, which violates immutability. And this, for people, uh, a lot of people, th this really like was antithetical to the spirit of crypto. On, on a pragmatic basis, I, I think this is more of like a mulligan. It, like Ethereum was in its early days, you know, like, it, yes, it was an early screw up. I don't think it would ever happen again. And in fact, with the parity multi-sig hack, which was a lot more money, those two, like, that was a non-starter that, that anything would get reversed. But let's think about a scenario where, let's say Putin and uh, you know the leader of China, and you know, so let's say people ganged up on Vitalik uh, and the Ethereum Foundation and really put some pressure on them. What could they really do? Like Ethereum is, is controlled by, no, by, by miners. Um, soon it will be controlled by stakers. How, how can you, well, let's, say, let's say the EF wanted to foist some awful you know, sort of thing like we're gonna um, we're gonna redistribute wealth from your wallet to everybody else. We're gonna have UBI mandated UBI. People would have to support that to run the code. They're, they don't just blindly follow a, you know Vitalik or something. So, you know, I understand that the the violation of the immutability after the DAO is very rankling in some sense, but it was also early on, and, and you know this this hasn't happened since. So okay, so you don't think that um, such a rollback would ever occur again? You're saying that was a one-time thing because. It was a, it was a, it's an early, it's an early, it was in an early stage, and you know now basically, um, even if people lose a bunch of money, or even if somebody important, uh, even even a government a government official loses a lot of money, that they won't be able to pressure anybody to reverse that that transaction. Correct. Yeah, like people have already lost a lot of money, and there's no idea that we need to do another chain split. And I think it's part of that kind of 
unspoken social contract. Like we had our mulligan in ETH, it was early on, you know, and everybody moved on. Things are audited much better now. In terms of like, you know, I, I think one of the nice things about proof of stake is it's trying to be even more censorship resistant. Like you're trying to spread consensus uh, uh, even, you know, more uh, uh, evenly. Um, and uh, I mean, time will tell, but like so far so good, right? Like I mean, look, like just think about like DeFi right now. This is insane. Like people, there's 50 billion dollars in DeFi. Nobody can stop it. Um, well, I hope you're right, man. So, so do DeFi investors, <laughs> which is a great segue into my into this. Um, Kirk Dameron is a local crypto guy, and a, um, he's he's been you've been in part of the ETH community for quite a while. Um, he was kind enough to, to bring this book out of the ether, uh, detailing kind of uh, what happened in Ethereum. I haven't had a chance to really dig in yet, but it's a, it's a cool book. Uh, there's a lot of interesting history. Um, the only problem is I don't have an easy way of giving this out. Can anybody think about it? Tokenize it. So, put it on the box. Too? Mm -hmm. <laughs> two, la two last questions. Danielle? Oh, I just had okay, an three. idea. Danielle, Ty, and then the corner. He asked for an idea. I thought that if someone joined the Liberty on the Rocks Patreon tonight, they might be able to get that book. Yes. That's awesome and I'm gonna, idea. when you're done, I'm going to plug it a little bit more. So maybe we could team up on that. Okay. That's a great idea. Okay. Patreon. So Patreon. Patreon. I'll, I'll, when he's done, I'm going to plug it a little more. <laughs> Correct me if I'm wrong, but for that DAO hack rollback, that wasn't a unilateral decision by the Ethereum Foundation that still took a majority of miners' consensus, right? Absolutely. So if the Chinese government said, Vitalik, do this, People they would have to convince half of the miners on that network. Precisely. To do that, that. that was my well, that was my point. You created a hard fork, so there wasn't a consensus. It was a, it was a well, contentious hard fork. So, some, some miners chose to run the original software, and then there wasn't a fork, but that, that didn't work. You know, of course, they, they can have their own fork party do whatever they want with sure. their, their hash power. That was they were entirely within their rights. But the the, the chain that was sort of, the, you know, that represented the, um, you know, the, 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 the yeah the original or the, the non original like the get rid of the, the hack version. You know, that was kind of the canonical chain. Most of the community supported the, the DApps, and and life moved on. Um, and that's not to say that there won't be, you know, like. Contentious hard fork. There's probably going to be one uh, when, with a switch to proof of stake, or maybe even like uh, the, the fee burning with one five five nine. And uh, again, we're getting like crazy down the rabbit hole. But like, this is this is like new ways to achieve consensus, new ways for people to interact and you know to, to govern projects. Um, yeah, like, but, but there are no like kings in in Ethereum. A, a lot of Bitcoiners. Uh, really dislike the idea of something like anything having a foundation because Bitcoin doesn't really have that. But at the end of the day, you know, Bitcoin is not immune to these things either. Like, you know, if the Chinese government decided to nationalize miners, there could be issues. And Bitcoin itself had its own contentious con or, um, debate about block size a few years ago. So, you know, we're, we're all kind of making this up as it's going along, but um, it's going well so far. I think. <laughs> Last question. Okay. Yeah, so it's kind of a two-part question, um, and let's kind of jump off of this statement that we're all making this up as we go along. Um, so the next question will depend on your answer to this first one. So you <laughs> you seem optimistic about uh, a blockchain social media platform. Uh, I first want to know, like, what what do you think that would look like? What's like, what's your ideal vision of that? Uh, that's a good question. So something that the um you know, I guess you could divide it between the front end and the back end. The front end ideally would be served by something that is censorship resistant or IPFS. Uh, to ha if I needed some like decentralized and immutable um, file storage, maybe for pictures or something, that's a, that's a project that has censorship resistant properties. Um, you, there's even been some early efforts towards social media like Steam it, uh, Steam. Um, I don't. I didn't. Mines. What's it? Mines. Is Mines on the blockchain? Um, I'm not familiar with that one, Mines. Mines? Um, yeah. But there are some early experiments about like with social media. The biggest problem right now, and the biggest challenge, uh, it, like if I if you told put a gun in my head and said, Kent, you got to build this right now, I'd say I can't do it because um, the, the, the scalability is not quite there yet. Um, uh, Ethereum only does like 15 transactions per second. There's, there's um, Projects like Cosmos that could do more, but when you're talking about like a, a Facebook or a Twitter, you're talking about uh, better scalability. The challenge in crypto is how do you scale um, without losing those properties? Like I can build a centralized blockchain 
and it, it has like a thousand transactions per second, but then I lose a lot of those great properties. Um, so scalability would be a tricky one, and there is um, there's a lot of innovation happening right now, like layer two platforms on, on Ethereum and new blockchains like Cosmos. Um, and you say you got a second part? Yeah, it's it's so I'll kind of provocatively start this out by saying that I'm really, really skeptical of the idea that decentralization is automatically revolutionary of its own accord. Because I don't think, um, for example, are you familiar with like the work of Deleuze and Guattari, like A Thousand Plateaus and so on? Okay, well it's kind of like, just like the mushrooms of philosophy. Um, as soon as we're decentralized, we have complete creative freedom, you know, we can't be censored. Um, and then, you know, this is the kind of like, you know, you brought up Solzhenitsyn, this is the sort of Jordan Peterson spiel of Solzhenitsyn. It's like, let's stop all these people from, you know, censoring us, censoring us right? So, um, my perspective on this is, you know, you talk a lot about the government, about how the government is very, like, you know, they're, they're out to get us, right? You gotta remember, the government is made, it consists of people, right? Just as everyone in the blockchain consists of people. We're all people. And we all have people problems. Um, so, when it comes to something like social media, uh, there's a lot of, um, I would say, I guess you could just call them 21st century communists who, who use, who, who like, who call the, cur the current tech companies, Google, Facebook, Apple, Amazon, and so on and so forth, they, they, they compare, they don't compare these companies to capitalism anymore, they more compare them to feudalism, because um, what a lot of these, their business models are essentially based on manipulating the thoughts and feelings and actions of the entire social field. So, so obviously we learned from the 20th century, we know what this overt authoritarianism looks like. Um, I, didn't, I heard almost nothing about a more covert authoritarianism, such that the, the kind that um, perpetuates you know, ideologies in our social field constantly. So, so I guess my question is, um, when it, say, you know, money no longer exists, we're in a completely decentralized, you know, revolutionary blockchain network, um, all of our commodities, all of our assets are exchanged within this network. Um, how, then my question is, you know, the regulation of human behavior in terms of, like, morality. It's because, like, obviously when you try to get the government to do that, a bunch of shit goes wrong. But, but when... But when people like a company like Facebook or a Amazon, Google, you know, a lot of people who work for these companies, they're not necessarily bad people. But this Let me thing just stop you real quick, because okay. you raised a lot of different questions and points here. So number okay. one, okay. absolutely, okay. like, and I, I don't want to give the impression, blockchain is not some panacea that's going to yeah. create a utopia for us. The decentralization, um, it can, at its worst, it can just be a meaningless buzzword. And not everything needs to be decentralized. Uh, but with respect to the examples I listed, I think it's going to be very, very helpful. Um, but yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's not like we're going to have this, um, you know, everything is just going to be um, unicorns and, you know, rainbows after things get more decentralized. Money will still exist, albeit in, central, in, in more um, digital form uh, and separate from the state, crucially. And here's the thing. Humans, okay, humans will always face pressure to organize themselves certain ways. And morality, obviously, you can't legislate morality when it, exactly. people do it. It turns out That's bad. my point. You can't legislate morality. But that's not, um, that is not uh, mutually exclusive to blockchain technology and decentralization. Like in, in a situation where crypto is, is rampant and everybody uses it, um, you know, if anything, it, it will make it harder for institutions to, to regulate um, morality. Like, okay, let's say somebody is running a, a platform that you don't like, you simply don't use it. And th the thing it doesn't solve for though is social pressures and like political correctness and like that's, you know, that's beyond tech, man. That's like something people have to figure out for themselves. Well, I, I also think it's beyond blockchain. I think that that's, th this is something that is very deeply instilled in like human behavior. Like, you know, we're social animals, right? Sure. And, so. and this is just, at the end of the day, this is just technology. You're talking about human nature, which is maybe we should all, you know, do some some, um, you know, drugs and figure out. Here we go. You know what I'm saying? Like, I mean, you're talking about raising yeah. human consciousness. This is this goes beyond even crypto. Right. Although a lot of crypto people and like to do that. And I think there's a lot of good uh, comparisons to be made between, like, the psychedelic world and the crypto world. Yeah, for, for so, sure. That is so awesome. Sure. So yeah. I think we're... That's our talk. Uh, thanks, everyone. <laughs> <laughs>